estoy colaborando en el laboratorio de energía. Primero, eh, quiero agradecer a, a Franco y a Daniel por, por permitirnos hacer la, la, la lectura aquí en este horario. También agradecer a la sección Uruguay, a IFG, a México, por supuesto. Bueno, y ahora les voy a introducir, eh, hoy no les voy a contar lo que es la IEEE, la Student Ranch, qué actividades hicimos, qué actividades vamos a hacer. Eh, solo contarles que el, tenemos la primicia de que todos los estudiantes que quieran hacerse miembros de, eh, del IMB les lo pueden hacer gratuitamente, así que están todos invitados. Eh, ahora lo voy a presentar. Bueno, eh, doctor Nitina Khan es actualmente el miembro fundador. Eh, él fue un miembro fundador del Departamento de Ingeniería Biomédica y es profesor en la Universidad de Houston. Se recibió como ingeniero eléctrico e hizo la maestría en la Universidad de Estambul en Antropía y obtuvo su doctorado en la Universidad de Rutgers en 1990. El eh, doctor Akai eh, ha jugado un, papel, un rol muy importante en la educación biomédica a nivel mundial. Bueno, y ha escrito, escribió y editó muchos libros tanto de, como de, también publicaciones en la otra revista, por ejemplo, el presidente de IGE, y ha participado en numerosas conferencias, simposios y talleres de tecnología en de ingeniería y médica, y también en escuelas de verano. ¿Sí? Así que ahora lo mismo con él. Years past, 1987, <coughs> I'm traveling with my advisor in another continent. 
I was explained to him that we can use this concept to detect the coronary occlusions. So basically, we can develop the sensors, we can put on the chest, and if the artery is partially occluded, we can grab this strange noise and turn it into something that can have incredible applications. He was not too, so much excited, and finally, someone sitting behind us, who was the president of one of the Japanese companies, and was interested in investing on this project. So the small, tiny things could turn into the almost 200, 300 million US dollars project. I'm sure that you have experienced many of them. Still we are working, many colleagues are working, and in fact my advisor and his other colleagues were interested, where initially they had some studies as well like this. Even before, after me actually, 1967, two medical doctors, they went to the American Heart Conference, and they said that <coughs> before surgery, we hear some strange noise coming from the heart sounds, they can even hear it. When they do angioplasty, when they modify the stenosis, that strange noise disappears. So what was happening, this is the first heart sound, second heart sound, and first heart sound, second heart sound. The doctors claim that diastolic portion, the low modulation, they can hear these extra sounds, and after surgery they cannot hear. Two cases. So this is a simple example of what biomedical engineering engineers can do. This, first of all, engineering concept is we are innovators. We are, we always come up brilliant ideas. We are creators. We turn into something useful for the society. This could be biomedical application, could be energy, could be power, could be something else. Okay. So my focus is going to be more the innovation concept of it. It's not only just doing the lab, but we are all the way, just think about something bigger than and also persistence. And it's if you are not determined to work, at least 15 hours a day. If you're not determined to work all day, you will never ever succeed. It doesn't matter wherever you are. I think this is, it doesn't matter how smart you are. And I'm looking for my career. It's not, I'm not the most successful scientist. I'm just one of the, I was lucky, I was working hard, I was with the right people at the right time, whatever you name it. But one thing I observed from many people, in 2001, I was in uh, Stockholm, 100th year's anniversary of the Nobel Prize scheme. I was one of the participants for the celebrations. When you meet with the people, and you meet with the Nobel laureate in the whole floor, except myself and the lady makes the bet we didn't have the Nobel Prize. Everybody has the Nobel Prize. The common thing of them, they were extremely determined. They were very persistent. They were very passionate about their doing. I never ever met anyone achieve and build something who did not have, like they didn't consider their work as a religion. This is my lecture towards the more young people. <laughs> Professor sorry about that. It's very important that you have to answer. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering. I don't care about the professorship. Uh, this is, uh, department is located in Houston. I'm building completely brand new biomedical engineering department. The 12 professors I'm going to hire, they are not going to be engineers. First of all is, uh, the concept that we are going to bring it and indeed real mixture of medicine medicine industry and academic engineering because the students should be exposed to cross section of this tree. I think whatever you do as an engineer, if you're working on computer science man, if you increase the source space five times, ten times. If you go home, if you tell your mother that I increased the storage space ten times, versus if you go home and say that, we discovered genius, 
we highly likely we believe that responsible for Parkinson's disease. Which one would excite your mind? Storage space or something else? I think the beauty of the field of biomedical engineering, you have immediate impact on somebody's health. So it's tremendous field. This is some statistics about the disease that we have been, uh, we are going to face. This is from World Health Organizations. I think next two decades, three decades, we will be suffering significantly from chronic disease, more cardiorespiratory disease. And there is some increase that you can see that for the neurological disease and cancer, but the, most of the diseases are related to environment or HIV, malaria, those kind of diseases will be history as long as we have enough resources for those. So the young people are considering the education in those areas needs to be really, uh, focus areas should be more chronic disease, should be. I'm gonna skip some of that would be enough to say that the healthcare we spent tons of money, I think it's, I don't wanna translate it to the pesos, we have to multiply everything by 20. As you can see that, the world we spent four trillion dollars for healthcare. The country like the United States is spent almost half of it. Of course, we spend more money for the army, for the other wars that's going on around the globe. But the healthcare is the one that is constantly increasing spending. And it, it feels funny that I'm, every day I'm, I never ever leave the home without looking for the New York Times or check the BBC or others, because it's a sort of um, something I learned from my father. He was local businessman, was also a politician. He never ever leave the home without checking the news. Uh, before I came here, I was looking for the news. A California judge decided to let some of the prisoners to go home. Do you know why? Do you know how much money we spent for prison? Any inmate in the Jail. It's almost 30,000 US dollars per prison per year. $30,000. And how much we can pay to educate someone? Uh, private schools are expensive in the United States. You spend $50,000 per year. And public school, you have to pay. I think you're very lucky here, you don't pay anything. And uh, some of Fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. The problem that is, these people are getting old. When they get old, they require a lot of uh, heart transplant. They require heavy, expensive treatments. So they, they cannot afford to pay the bill. That's one of the reasons. And also, prisons are getting old problems, so they they have to let some people to go. So they are spending seven thousand dollars per person does not really provide a good health care. I think because the health care should be, uh, at least majority of the people should have an access to basic health care. Really. This is interesting. If you look at this one, uh, x-axis shows the spending per person. As soon as any country spends $1,000 per person, life expectancy is almost very really close to the normalized. 65, 67, but this equal access is very important. I don't mean that everybody should have the, everything the same, but at least the basic insurance should be provided to every citizen. Biomedical engineering is future. The reason biomedical engineering is future, if you look at the market points, it's the only area <coughs> increase, significant increase, you can see almost 30% <coughs> Instrumentation-wise, anywhere you go in hospital, if you look at them, everything is built by the engineer. Can be electrical, can be mechanical, can be chemical engineers. In fact, the because of the contribution of the engineers, healthcare costs 50% reduced. But we cannot continue. I mean, if you want to reduce healthcare costs another 50 years, we should be shifting our focus into the into the areas that it's more emerging technologies, more uh, technologies that is nano-based, nano-technology, nano, 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 n
vision and intensity if we really want to have more. The market, as you can see, that we are talking about $300 billion just for instrumentation in the United States. And there's a giant market is coming in Asia Pacific area in China, incredible focus by the government in fact, to produce low cost affordable devices. So if company A is producing MRI, $1.5 million, another company in China is producing $250,000, like one sixth of them. So it's very important that it's, everything should be affordable, portable if possible, because right now ultrasound device, we have portable ultrasound device. And uh, also the uh, user can and reach out to developing countries and developing Biofarm is the highest, is almost $600 billion. That's is almost GDP between Spain and Brazil. The Biomedicating is a discipline, as you can see, that the main motive is to solve <coughs> the problems in <coughs> medicine and biology and also understand the related mechanism before develop therapeutics and run. The field is getting very popular, as I'm sure that many of you are ITP members. There was a survey between the deans and deans of medical school and the engineering school considered to be the, the engineering field for the future. And the second one, in my view, is the energy, energy related, renewable energy, or the uh, energy engineering. More and more universities are building departments right now. Application wise, in the United States, when I started my PhD, we had only eight primary engineering departments. Right now, we have nine. In fact, in the United States, application to electrical mechanical engineering degree, <coughs> only one field is increasing biomedical engineering. But it's opposite <coughs> in the Asia Pacific area, in China and India, more and more people still apply for the fundamental engineering disciplines because they are more production oriented societies right now. Okay. In order to have strong and sustainable biomedical department, department should involve the following elements. First of all, healthcare industry is very important. When you open department, unless students, when they graduate, if they don't get a job, that field will not be sustainable. Okay. So the industry is the critical part. And second part is the looking for affiliated hospitals and medical school. The student should have internship, should get involved with the medical doctors and the medical professionals. The medical doctors are no longer medical doctors we had 10, 20 years ago. At least the people right now in the United States or Europe, even in China, they are more and more doing PhD and EDs. If you look at the Nobel laureates, in the area of the physiology and medicine life. Many of them, they have PhD in this. And Steve Chu is one of them. He's a uh, Nobel laureate and is also the Secretary of Energy in the United States. He knows electronics as much as anybody else knew. And he was the first person to observe the motion of the single molecule battery. So the education has been much more integrated and it's not really only one discipline. I will show you the one example that what I mean by that. The, of course, the physical and life sciences are larger than life. So if 
someone does not have good mathematical background, cannot understand gene-to-gene -gene interaction, cannot fill the map, cannot understand the protein motion, because it's, everything is related to stochastic process you use for communication, you can easily apply it. So the mathematics and also the uh, students, many students, especially in the United States, they don't like the mathematics and said that they're not going to use the mathematics. You don't need to use mathematics. Mathematics helps think you better. So the mathematics, we should not be afraid of the mathematics for training. You need it. If you want a good medical doctor, you have a good mathematician. And I'm my background also electric and undergraduate, master in electric but when I was undergraduate, I also had the uh, joint degree in math and physics beside undergraduate. And I was able to finish the undergraduate until one and a half years. Not right now, but I'm right now I'm reading everything ten times. My memory is making a detection. And I don't remember anything properly. The trust area lines. Well, when you reach to my age, you will have the same thing. <laughs> but for me, it's more important that I have to remember what, what my wife told me to do. <laughs> if you look at the trust areas I put there, these are the, the fields that cardiovascular engineering, neural and rehabilitation engineering is extremely important because we are aging. If you look at the market, we are having much today. I looked around, I didn't see young people except the, we have three four young people in our table, and that's all the people there were older than me being at restaurants. You know, so average 60 something. Everywhere. You go to Japan, more and more elderly populations. In fact, you know why we need more younger people to work, I guess, right? When you look at the bus station and wherever you walk and you can see that this more. It's not important to read more. It's important to have a high quality life when you are older. So the improved quality so neural rehabilitation engineering is very important to provide a system. System biology, bioinformatics, it's a, the, another field, it's the highly uh, desirable field, is to understand the, <coughs> it's related to drug design, it's related to gene regulatory networks, it's related to uh, biodynamics, it's related to anything that we can build, biological building blocks can be used for repair purposes. Molecular cell tissue engineering, experimental imaging, this is the one that commonly used by managing trust areas. What should be different is education wise, right? Again, when we were undergraduate students, we had no clue about the engineering management, no clue about the engineering economics, no clue about the communication. If you do not have good communication skills, you cannot be the engineer. You have to explain your project or whatever you do, common people. I think the criteria, my mother is 78 years old, I should be able to explain to her that what I am doing. Because she is the taxpayer, right? It's very important if you cannot tell your problem to somebody else. So the, our education system should be transformed from exam-based system more to hands-on development and presentation type system for the future. And also we have to encourage our students to take more economic, more management courses as well as the basic courses. Because every idea should be transformed into the product. This is, we live in a world right now, I'm not talking about global this, I'm talking about the, there's an investment on project that project should be transformed into something to the benefit of the society. We have to encourage the faculty and students to build their own companies. Entrepreneurship is extremely important. Okay, these are the, some successful biomedical engineering departments and programs. There is one thing that is very unique that is, if you have more graduate students, more PhD students, the reputation and all the universities is much higher compared to more undergraduate. So the, of course these schools are extremely selective. The one that I was the uh, faculty at Dr. Nkali, 100 people applied and only we accepted the top five of them. There's an incredible selection and this top five, all of them graduate. So the retention rate is almost 100%. Okay. 
and I can get phone call. I remember that once, Saturday, 11.30 p.m. Students phoned me, said that I'm at the department, I have a question, can you please come and help me? I packed and I went and I helped her. This is very important to have the interaction. someone is interested for undergraduate classes. In addition to the more basic fundamental math and physics set, we always teach the introduction to biomedical engineering at the freshman level. And I teach that course as a department chair. It's very important that student should see department chair, decano, or rector in the classroom teaching introduction courses. Because it's link them and then connect them with each other and also the university. So that's the high-powered faculty always teach the freshman courses. On contrary, many places that they give the junior faculty or lecturer or somebody else, if there's more than 100 people, you're smiling at them. <laughs> and also the interesting classes is the capstone hands-on project. And all of them are industry supported and the local industry or the uh, other industry from the United States. So that's where we work very closely with the students. Some of the results that we recently had using dual energy city. $1,000 and the PET scan it costs $2,000. Right? 
I don't mean that in the United States the doctors are not really technology oriented. In fact, in my view, the U.S. medical doctors are much more familiar with the technology compared to the rest of the world. The reason for that in the United States, you should get four years degree after high school in order to go to the medical school. So almost 15% or close to 20% of medical doctors, they have electrical engineering degree, mechanical engineering degree, chemical engineering degree, then they go to the medical school. So when I go to the meet with the, our cardiologist, the cardiac surgeon, he can teach us the Fourier transform, he can talk about the wavelet transform, they are very low because they took so much math courses and other things. It had also it, they embarrassed the, and raised the uh, technologies much faster than other one. One surgeon, Bill Cohn, he has four or five companies his own, and he's an inventor of many things related to cardiovascular system, artificial heart. When you talk to this person, you will surprise that I mean, you're talking CEO of the company, he talks like economists, he talks like engineers, he knows the more mechanical uh, theories and like college professors at mechanical engineering department. So it's very different. The imaging is, we are going to spend uh, using more CT because CT is cheaper and it's easy to uh, handle. But the, I'm going to talk about a little bit the new version of the CT developed by Siemens and also GE, latest version of it. Oh, this is the, how much the imaging has been used in the United States. It looks like the election result. In the West Coast and East Coast, always Democrat and Middle Part or the uh, Republican. Uh, okay, Central Left, Democrat. It's getting confusing. And it's the Republican, so right and center. Yeah. Left and center. Okay, so. <laughs> well, this is the Obama is okay. The other side in the middle is okay. <coughs> So more technology used East and West Coast, education levels are higher from a middle part is the more And it's the spending is skyrocketing. It's amazing for the, the imaging part. Okay. This is the CT scan developed by the, uh, the Siemens. In fact, I'm also the affiliated with uh, Mayo Clinic. We are the first to receive that time the first city to the city system. And then they give the one in the Tokyo, one and Paris. If you look at the image, you're getting from, I'm going to turn off the light that <coughs> one. So, we can, you can see the, the all the arteries and veins and from the foot using CT. Incredible technology. It's using two different densities in fact. The idea is, can we use dual energy CT for detection of the cardiac portion instead of MRI? Because uh, it's not, MRI is not very good for the heart because of the heart is always in motion and also the resolution is. If you look at here, there are four different types of the optogenes. One of the uh, classified one, left hand side. And then second one is the mixed. I hate being short sometimes. <laughs> you have to just trust me. This is the mix between the fibers and also classified. And the fibrous one and the most difficult one is the lipid one. What people are doing in Japan or elsewhere, they use the the ultrasound system at the tip of the catheter, they go they ch check the classified type of it. If someone has classified, will not die easily, I can assure you, because it's there, they are not going to move anywhere. But if it is the lipid, if it's moving, can go and clock something else somewhere else. So the, the type should be determined, it's extremely important, as much as the severity of those. The our goal, we just want to develop the metric system to, especially for soft plug for the technical tunnel occlusion. In addition to the one that I have mentioned here, right now we are using micro technology. We are going to get the three dimensional images using more than 64 electrodes here. We have developed the micro uh, or micro 
nano based and can call the macro elements. So the, uh, of course we are looking for the volumes, we are looking for the angles of the arteries and the composition. And it's before we apply the system interpretation, we have developed the, our own system. It's basically, this is artificial heart. We are putting the different type of occlusions into this heart. It's actually moving out. Okay. And the occlusion we know, radial extension we know, and also the density of those. And we have the typical one is the fibrous 80% stenosis is a fibrous flat okay. If you look at how it's inserted into the artery, <coughs> and these are the three different densities, three different uh, stenosis and three different locations in the heart. In fact, the most difficult part, if it is occlusion close to uh, branches, it's the most difficult part actually. Okay. Then we put into the CT and then we can look at the occlusions and we can try to determine the occlusions based on the algorithm developed by us. For example, the dipid one, the density 0.9 micron per cc, uh, cc, and we are moving each time, and you can see that it's, this is the origin one, and this, this is the axial. We can map them. At the end of the our result, when we look at the, this is the x-axis is the known standard, and the y-axis is determined by us, there is a, almost like 0.61 correlation. This is not very good, actually. Then we use the uh, software uh, developed by and others and to really uh, look at for the central sitting per multi-terminal construction. That time, when we look at them, it's the, the, there was an improvement, especially if the occlusion is 80%, and we have more or less the, for three different densities, and we were able to especially to determine the uh, stenosis. We were not worried about the anything below 50 because doctors did not touch any stenosis less than 50% for operation purposes. <coughs> Most of the time they look at anything 70 and 80% they operate on those. One issue with the coronary remodeling This is the normal vessel at the first one, and then minimal CAD, as you can then see them almost a crescent type things. The shape of the artery is changing. And it's bigger <coughs> bigger, and the area, the blood flow goes, becomes very small. The issue is here, the thickness of thickness here is very, very critical. Somehow for the men's that thickness is smaller compared to ladies. Rupture is very, uh, could happen. That's why more rupture happens in men compared to women. Okay? And this is for the human. For fibrous versus lipid. If you look at, uh, for the 0.9 fibrous, 0.95 lipid, we were more or less able to detect the true versus the density ones. And the, we are also looking for the possibility of the ruptures, man versus woman. And it's the highly likely that men will have myocardial infections, and highly likely that ruptures could happen in men. And these are the uh, three different, especially major arteries that these ruptures could happen is the LAD is one of them, and the, also the LC and right coronaries. So what we are doing to improve the, uh, to develop the system, we are also looking for the, based on this slicing, we are looking for the angle 
how much, what is the angle that the artery is blocked. For example, this one, 175. This one is 230. Those are used for the expert system as an input to determine the risk of the patient. And again, these are totally non-invasive approach for the detection purposes. So the size, extension, compos composition, density, and locations are very critical. And we are currently developing the expert system. This also uses the sound system is coming from the other studies with the nanotechnology based for the detection of the coronary arteries. I will talk about the switch into the little bit slightly different area. I will talk about the bit the another immersion area, neural engineering. Neural engineering is not a new field. Many people, they were working in areas of neuroscience. They were applying engineering tools and methods for understanding of the uh, fundamental neuroscience related issues. And they never called to themselves neural engineering. But lately, this is a reversion discipline and has been accepted by NIH and NSF. And many universities, they have programs related to neural engineering. Our brain is maybe, it's not the one of the most heaviest ball we have. It's roughly 1 to 1.4 kg. But if you look at the consumptions of the blood, it's almost 30% of the blood they go to the brain. I think the amazing part is the Number of the neurons, we have no idea how many of them you can consider as an electric engineer. Number of the transistors, according to some folks, 10 to 11, 10 to the 12. And if you look at the connection of them, we are talking about 10 to the 15 transistors and talking each other. I think this is a massive system. I don't think any system, any existing engineering system cannot do this. Imagine that having all those transistors, you will burn the uh, brain will burn out if you build the brain existing such a technology as we do. One area is very hot and the for uh, neural engineering is the brain computer interface. We have several applications from the application to commercial use. The simple system is to record the electrical activity of the brain. The brain is one of the most dynamic organs, even during sleep we have electrical activities coming from the brain. This can be determined to state of the brain and also emotion of the brain and also it could be used to get useful information from the brain and to activate the other devices surrounding devices in the environment. As you can see that is chips are placed into the brain and the purpose of this one is to decode Okay. These electrical activities transform into the more mechanical activities to activate the artificial arms, artificial processes, or robot arms located in another room or another place in the same country or elsewhere. One typical example is to again EEG activity has been reported from the brain and recorded and this can be used to control the environment, turn on, turn off lights. And also help someone with the wheelchair to help them with the intention to move the wheelchair in the room. I think the most fascinating one is to use this technology to speed the recovery of the stroke patient or speed the recovery of the Parkinson's patient. The issue that each time when we deal with the brain computer interface, this is my case case, simple, my case is simple on the computer, and there is a bunch of objects, it's try to move the cursor to one of the objects. Each time, if there's a difference between them, just getting feedback by visual feedback, monkey try to correct the trajectory <coughs> each time. Okay? Note that these signals are coming directly from monkey's brain, so the uh, motor cortex is not sending we are not looking for what the motor cortex sending through the arms and move. Just to, we are independently collecting the data from the brain and we are decoding the data. Okay? The issue is visual feedback is not enough. For the next 10 years, 20 years, we have to build the human interface system. The feedback directly goes to the sensory area. Sensory area could be the monkeys on there that 
information should be carried to the brain and the brain should do the computation. And I think the most, uh, more challenging one This one, if you look at the, the feature of the very interface, the error related to touch proximity and the location of the object will turn into the electrical stimulus and will be directly go to the sensory area in the brain. And this way, the recovery, this way, the follow of the uh, object will be much faster, much quicker. Another fascinating one is the implanted one. This is objects completely implanted to the brain. <laughs> this is the work by the Brown group. If you look at here, monkey is trying to reach out to blue and also they are recording single unit activity from the brain. Okay? Implanted electrode. And you can see that the firing of the neurons is significantly increased when monkey reach out to blue. But if you look at the recording system, it's almost unseen system should be in Smithsonian Museum. The power consumption is almost 60 in the What they are developing right now is technology. We can put multi-array electrode directly into the brain, as you can see here. <coughs> and it does the certain preprocessing application can be done there, and signal by wire can go to the just above the door. Over there we have nano or micro basic. The purpose of this just give the information by light outside. At the same time, it's getting the inductive power from outside into the system. So the, when you look at the subject, it's, this is the size and as you can see that it's tiny bit things is there, like almost smaller than um, <coughs> anything you can imagine. It's placed there and it's completely implanted in the system and it has the like, power is 10 watts So this informant also is capable to reach out to 10 to the 40 meters and it goes back to the, the figure I was showing you that is the subject has completely uh, independent, no wires coming, and can use the system for the monitoring uh, for rehabilitation purposes or any other functions that you can imagine that they can do. Second interesting one is this is the subject, and she she lost all the upper the arm, as you can see that, and she's a young lady traffic accident. One way to put the artificial arm, you need to have better connection between the remaining parts and the artificial arm. So basically, we are trying to let silicone speaks with the neuron. But when part is cut, as you can see there, not all the neurons are out, because most of the neurons are inside the area. So the Al Quicken is a professor at the research in Chicago. By surgery, he was moving one by one the neurons very close to the close to the upper and close to the cut part. 
So then you can put the electrode, you can provide an outstanding the interaction and communication between them. This subject, it was capable of exert the power and turn the key and also can eat the food that one. So this involved neurosurgery, involved electron, involved everything. The, our intention, our group, I have been affiliated with the Albert. We are very much interested to have the nano or micro, uh, micro you know, nano size, the electrodes completely implant into the uh, arm. And then, we look at here, this way, if there's any broken communication, the we can provide, bypass the unbroken area with the electrodes and provide uh, the, uh, the signals can pass through the system. We intentionally put the horizontal because we want much more contact point between the neurons. We have tried on the animals and the next step we are going to work on the animals. This is the first artificial shoulders built by the Chicago group and has the more or less the same function as any normal person. We'll go to the most challenging. Alzheimer's disease is, is going to be one of the major health issues that we have to all face. Not only patients, also people at home. It's related to memory. Right? All days, not many people suffer from Alzheimer's disease because not many people live more than 65. Right now, average age in Japan is 3, 5, 4 men and women. So the more elderly population we have, more people will suffer from Alzheimer's disease. The story is, in our brain, we have an area that's called the hippocampus area. It's like much smaller, it's like one millimeter to two millimeter and 26 millimeter, all more. If we remove this area from the brain, and all the short term memory is <coughs> So which means that I can introduce myself to you, and we know we speak each other two minutes. I go outside, come back again, and you say, who are you? This is the short term memory. But sometimes it's better not to remember everything. Right? The ladies are very good to remember everything. Since you're not eating, I can talk. Right? Whatever I do for my wife, she still remembers 20 years ago. It was 15 years late to pick her up. <laughs> but the, the beauty of the system, it's actually it's an engineering system. I will show you why it's an engineering system. And the people, they significantly contribute to understanding the mechanism of hypercampus but they have to do engineering basically. For, if you look at it, there are three significant areas. Inputs are coming for EG and then project CA1, CA1 goes to CA3. They have different functions on it. If you look at how the neurons line up, it looks like it's a system, parallel system. <coughs> cells are parallel and then they are leaving the one area to the other area projects each other. Look at the edge of the system. This system is nothing more than single input, multi-output, or multi-input, multi-output system. So we can model the each section, CA1, CA3, using Walter expression, the nonlinear dynamic analysis methods. <coughs> In fact, the group, Vasilis Marvelis from the University of Southern California, uh, and his group, they have developed the model for this, and they also look at the activity when they are teaching something to the rat. Rat has a very different dose of a micrometer. And of course, they are not monkey, monkey will be faster than Red, but the, their ultimate goal, I'm going to tell you this We can have monkey, we can train the monkey. Each time monkey does good job, we give the banana day and day and day. Okay. So monkey knows that whenever they behave, when they are good, capture the object on the screen, they will get the banana. From these activities, at the same time, we can put multi-channel electrodes to area, we can determine the transfer function of CA3 and CA1 completely. And we can put this model into the VLSI chip, we can independently, we can have a neural chips and it's mimic or resembles the transfer function from CA1 to CA3. If we remove this area from my brain and 
if you train the monkey to do everything, and monkey, if you put the banana, most likely, in fact, reality, monkey does not go and grab the banana. But if you replace that area with this VSI system, simple electric management chips, and put out the monkey. This is going to change, revolutionize the world. If they succeed, we will have a different one. I'm talking about the revolution, scientific revolution. I'm talking about the very time myself. We're supposed to take a break, right? Yes. We need break five minutes. Okay, five minutes break. <laughs>